Okay, welcome to Gorilla Physics, and this is the trick. This is Dr. Lemon's trick to Paper 3 Physics. A lot of people are asking just who is Dr. Lemon? Who is he? Uh, well, you don't really need to know, I guess. Well, all right, he is the guy sitting spinning in this chair here. Um, he is the guy who has mastered Paper 3. He's ready to go uh, on Monday, just as I'm sure you guys are, and um, he is the guy who's going to share his trick with you just now. Um, right, and without further ado, it's all about the way that you read the questions. Because this idea of um, RTFQ gets banded around a lot. Read the question, RTFQ. I'm sure you've heard, heard of it, but I'm not convinced that a lot of people really know how to RTFQ. So that's Dr. Lemon's trip trick, okay? Um, and in this live feed, I'm going to go through that and make that really clear to you how you read a paper-free question, how you read any exam question, really. This should be really, really useful to you. I've also been asked for these things, and I'm going to do these things um, shortly. I'm going to do some details for Fermisters and for Gamma uh, Rays Practical based on all exam board stuff. And when you see some of the examples of the RTF queuing for Edexcel, you'll notice what I'm saying to you quite a lot, which is you should pay attention to the way other exam boards do practicals, because they will be the variations that you might get in the paper. They are, you know, they're, they're all written by people who have taught physics for a long time, who know the kind of way around practicals, all the different ways we can achieve similar sort of results. Um, so I think that's a really interesting one for you to pay attention to today because actually some of the things we were talking about in the AQA stuff are going to come up in this Edexcel question I'm going to share with you later. And then lastly, somebody in the AQA live stream that I've just finished doing uh, asked me for uncertainties and some typical uncertainties and ways to actually calculate typical uncertainties. So I will talk through those as well, including how to compound uncertainties. So without further ado then, just a bit more detail before I go into it then, how you RTFQ is what Dr. Lemon's trick is all about. How you read the question um, is really important. And it's not just a case of a lot of people just say, oh, you know, read it twice or read it carefully and under underline the keywords. Well, what are you actually looking out for, right? Well, here's how you're going to do it. First, the first time you read it, you're going to read it for what are you going to do. So what is the question actually asking you to do? Is it asking you to calculate something? Is it asking you to deduce something? Is it asking, what is the command word? What is the statement it's actually asking you to get to? And the second time you read it, you think, well, what information do I have to be able to do that? It may ring a lot of bells if you're into cognitive load theory. Um, thanks, AXA. Um, and I will do also an AQA, uh, AQA, a Q and A at the end. Okay, not just for AQA, for all exam boards. All right. Um, so, for example, right, uh, it might be reading through those twice. You do it, and you actually read, um, and you're trying to think, well, what what key principle or law do we actually have to apply to this question to solve the problem? It might be that you're reading it and you're thinking, okay, what evaluation idea am I actually doing here? It might be you're reading it and you're thinking, well, what could I actually do I actually know to solve this problem without even needing to use any of the information? Maybe this is actually an easier question that, I, I really, um, that I'm really making it, okay? And that will become come clear as I go through some examples of RTF queuing in a little while. It might be about identifying your cause of error it might be about actually the synoptic questions. What area of physics do I need to solve this? Okay. <laughs> All right. And um, look at the chat. Nice chat. Thanks a lot, Joel. Yeah, I appreciate it. I've enjoyed this. Okay. If you've done 10 minutes of revision, I've done two hours of live streaming. All right. Thanks a lot, Joel. Yeah. Well, look, if it helps you, um, then it's worth doing. And these um, core practical videos and the AQA one and the OCR one I've done today, well, my last year's core practical video has been one of my most popular videos. So, you know, hopefully that'll go on to you to um, help the next year's out as well. So it's really good for me to get these things out and it saves me any time editing as well. So that's good. Um, so I'm going to go into it now. I'm going to go into, actually, I'm going to go into two um, practicals that are pretty likely to come up on Excel, we think. Um, not 100% sure, obviously. And full you know uh, just to be absolutely sure this is not a guarantee that anything will come up there's no way that I can do that but I'm going to talk about the Fermister practical um, which is uh, likely to come up uh, and potential dividers almost certainly will be coming up in paper free and um, I'm going to talk about the gamma in a bit more detail than I've done already in um, the OCR 
uh, stream and the AQA stream. So OCR call them PAGs and AQA call them required practical. So this is annoying because it's on uh, automatic move forward, but that's fine. So um, essentially, right, this one, Educast do this, they actually do this with a copper coil in a water bath, right, believe it or not, and then there should be a positive change. And um, they actually say that the change in um, resistance with temperature should be positive and linear, and maybe it looks linear over a very short range. And that's something we'll come back to when we look come to the graphs at the end. OCR do this practical, they use thermistors or LDRs, and you have to kind of work out an optimum range, a, a position during which the, the range during which the graph is at its steepest, and that's where it's most useful as a kind of temperature or a light sensor. And AQA don't do this one particularly, but they do have a length versus resistance practical, and they use a potential divider to um, get the uh, resistivity rather than just do it as a normal, um, yeah rather than just do it as a normal practical. Um, somebody in the chat already, electricity or water, yeah, uh, th there's not a problem with that as long as it's low, um, low voltage. If it's low voltage and it's not dangerous, Yam's been through four of my playlists today, that's awesome. All right, glad to hear it. Okay, so um, the Fermista and LDR vary along the lines like this. So this is the Fermista at the top here. Resistance decreases with temperature at a decreasing rate, so it's exponential curve actually. Uh, an LDR um, it has the same pattern and it's a quantum effect you know so maybe or part of the explain question they might give you might be partly to do with practical and partly to do with quantum effects being a big key principle in physics isn't it you know this would get that idea that mm, maybe that's what the question could be could be asked uh, after <laughs> all right and, and you need to make sure you're absolutely thoroughly versed in manipulating these type of equations that look something like this. So in this case, a thermistor might vary with R, that's the resistance at any temperature, T, um, equal to R naught, resistance at like a maximum temperature, um, uh, or maximum resistance possible, times by E to the power of B, which is just some constant, some decay constant in this case, uh, T. You have to be able to put them into Y equals MX plus C, right? So you learn both sides and you get an equation that looks like this, and a simple bit of moving around leaves us with Y equals MX plus C. So if I plot this, um, if I plot temperature on the X-axis and I plot LUN R on the Y-axis, I should get a straight line with a gradient of B. Um, and that would be the decay, decay constant. And then what, what they ask you to do in LXL is they actually ask you to calibrate a potential divider such that it will read three volts output across the thermistor when the temperature is 40 degrees, right? And that situation in a potential divider, if it's six volts across here, is where the two resistors are equal. So it's quite an easy calibration, really. But you could do that if they gave you any set of output, output voltages or... Um, or resistors, you could work that out just by simple ratios, and that's the way I would I would do that. It works every bit as good for GCSE as well. <laughs> um, and Joel, this is the motivation, man. Come on, we're working hard. We're ready to do it. I, I did my motivation feed last night as well. You should be ready for this. Okay, come on. Mm, you can do this. I feel, I feel it. It's till Monday. It's all lit, and then it's done. Then physics is done after Monday, and it's time to party. I hope you got your parties all planned after this okay so here's my raw um, data here's my raw resistance against temperature for a thermistor note the significant figures by the way you know come back to that in a little bit later on we quoted even the the graph look the equation for the um, slope there is giving those um, significant figures always two which is what I've measured to in this case then moving on we can learn um, the resistance okay and I get this and look I give learn R and R was measured in kilo ohms so even though the log of the resistance is dimensionless I still give the the um, unit that it had before I logged it right so now I've got a straight line and straight lines are a bit more accurate to read than the exponential curves are. So that's the reason in this practical for doing a straight line. I'm not too interested in the decay constant, okay, but it is the gradient of my graph here. So I can interpolate up from 40 to the line and across to a learn of a resistance. And then I unlearn, so I write raise E to the power of this and that gives me a resistance in kilo ohms, right? And then all I need to be doing is I need to be putting um, that into my circuit at 40 degrees. This will have that resistance in kilo ohms. So I need to have a resistor, a fixed resistor, with an equal resistance to that. So that will be, um, you know, that will give me an output equal to half of the input, which will be 3 volts. All right. 
I hope that makes sense everybody. Um, now we're just going to uh, talk a little bit about evaluative points with that practical and then we'll talk about the um, next practical and then we'll go back to some more detail about Lemon's secret uh, to paper free, trick to paper free. So evaluative points, so, so what you do really is you then measure your free volt, um, your output, does it actually give a free volt output? Um, does it actually give a free volt output at that that uh, temperature okay so did, how did it work did it work how close to free volts were you that would be like your percentage difference how successful was your experiment and importantly does the output fall within the percentage uncertainty right so if you um if you uh, if, if you add up all the uncertainties, uh, the percentage uncertainties, which I'll do at the end of this feed, if you add up those percentage uncertainties and work that back to your value of output, then does your result fall within that expected percentage uncertainty? If it does, then you've done a great job because you, you've been as accurate as you can be with the apparatus that you've got, right? If it doesn't, then there are ways that you can change that and you can look for some systematic error, you can look for some other errors and you can improve your practical if it's outside of the percentage uncertainty. Uh, what about the quality of his straight line? Let's have a little look. How far, okay, not all of these lie exactly on this straight line, do they? So maybe I'm thinking maybe at the lower temperatures, it was less accurate. No, but actually up here at the higher uh, temperature, I'm still quite far away from the line of best fit. So maybe it was about this idea of like thermal inertia. Maybe it takes a little bit of time for the thermistor to reach the same temperature of the water and I wasn't given enough time. So maybe I need to change my method rather than letting the uh, thermistor cool, uh, cool down, the hot water and let it cool down, I should maybe heat it up slowly so I can be a bit more sure that the thermistor is the same temperature as the water. And then there's a risk assessment as well. So maybe in this practical, they could talk about risk assessment. And this should maybe consider personal injury. Really hot water, you know, water has a very high specific heat capacity. So there's lots of energy stored in it. Really hot water can cause scalds, which can be really, really bad. Um, or But maybe it's actually damage to apparatus that is the issue, maybe melting some plastic or something like that. Well, so I hope that helps. And later on, you'll see that some of these extra details are so good to be learning because they can just be the answers to those paper-free questions, right? And that's what Dr. Lemon understands that you guys all need to understand as well. So now we're talking about the half thickness of gamma through lead. Okay, now that is the way um, at Excel do this one. And all exam boards have to have some kind of using ionizing radiation in their core practicals. So they need, you need to know how to use um, Geiger Muller tubes accurately as part of your core practicals. So we'll be talking about that in, um, in this one as well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the inverse square law that AQA do and EDUCAS do as well. Um, now this is good practice for understanding a power law versus exponential. So half thickness, is an exponential, okay? And the inverse square law is a power law, all right? So um, EDUCAS also, they do a DICE, DICE model for half-life, um, and you could maybe have that idea of comparing models between real thing and other thing. There's a lot about this, you know, get the gamma source in a lab only has a, is a cobalt 60, that's a pure gamma source, uh, it's a cobalt 60, but it only has a half-life of five years, right? So um, I know that mine in uh, my school um, is a very low activity, and that's because it's probably about 30 years old, maybe even older. I, I, I have a sneaking suspicion it might be up to like 50 years old because it was probably bought in the early days of that school, which were back in the 70s. So... Um, <laughs> there's this kind of you know issue we're actually giving you a very low reading because of this half life so maybe you know there could be difficult questions comparing like the half life of the source with some models and dice and so on and so forth um, I will do Q&A just towards the end, everybody, so stick around for that. So again, it's a, about a manipulation of a exponential equation. And yeah, somebody said that, look, they don't do the exponential for thermistors or resistors in there in the equation sheet, but they do expect you to handle any exponential or any power law. And I've got a good video about guessing which is an exponential power law, and I'll talk about that later as well. So make sure you know, we're basically with an exponential, you can just log the Y variable. So in this case, count rate. Um, through a uh, through a distance through uh, thickness of lead and you just log the y variable and you get a straight line for a power law you need to log both variables uh, x and the y variable basically so here I've just taken my expected um, equation and I've logged both sides and then I get back to a y equals mx plus c with minus mu being this kind of decay constant for the thickness of lead okay 
So this is my little diagram. It's just about increasing the thickness there. And you measure those thicknesses with a micrometer. A micrometer has a very small uncertainty, which is 0.01 um, millimeters. And then that over these you know, millimeter thicknesses that you're adding each time gives you a smaller possible um, percentage uncertainty. Talk about that in the uncertainty section. So the inverse square law, and I found it quite interesting and I talked about this a bit more detail in, in the AQA one, how they use uh, c to the power of minus a half rather than c against x squared. I thought it was quite interesting. It's because of this um, zero error here, which is like the, uh, the, the extra uncertainty that you get either side um, of your measurement of x because you're not sure exactly where the radiator is in the gamma source and you're not sure exactly where the ionizations are happening so you've got this systematic uncertainty and you can plan your variables and this is how they do it here such that your systematic uncertainty your systematic error is one of the intercepts and that means that the gradient isn't changed but the intercept has changed and it's very very useful so uh, this again is manipulation of an inverse square law into some kind of y equals mx uh, in this case plus c uh, equation Okay, so again, some um, kind of evaluative points. Then uh, using a corrected count rate is really important for this. So you take away the background radiation. Um, also talking about the orientation, we're talking a lot about this in the AQA life feed, the or orientation of the uh, the orientation of the Geiger Muller tube means that you know you're going to get a larger area because you want as large a count rate as possible to be as accurate as possible. Again, a larger thing that you're measuring or in a small scale that you're measuring on is the best way to give you the least percentage uncertainty. This could definitely come up with risk assessments. So irradiation is is very um, low risk really because the inverse square law it means that. Uh, you, you, you can use that to make sure that you are not going to have a large dose because twice the distance you quarter the dose. Also you minimize the time spent within the two meter radius as well, I should say two meters rather than minutes um, to mean you limit the dose, the irradiation dose. Now contamination is low, the risk of contamination is low because they're sealed metal sources. They're glued in very permanently. The school tests them out every year to check they're not leaking. Okay, it's very, very important. But basically for the use of these sealed metal sources, then it's a very low risk. With a protactinium generator, for example, which edXL do as well as one of the practicals, um, and lots of other people do as well, then you've got these salts, these uranium salts actually dissolved in a solution. And if that solution leaks, then there can be contamination. The uranium gets out and can get on things and can lead to future irradiation. And that's pretty dangerous. So we need to make sure we take steps for those. Um, repeat readings, so the more accuracy stuff, give greater accuracy because radiation is random. So when you've got a random error of any type, then you need to think about repeating spotting anomalies and taking a mean. That's the way to deal with a random error. A systematic error, you can't deal with it in that way. You have to have a different idea. And again, thinking of larger values, so leaving it for a longer time or having a more, more active sample will um, give you a lower percentage uncertainty. Right, so I hope that was, that was helpful. I'm going to go back um, into this because we want to talk about Dr. Lemon again. People are still asking, who is this Dr. Lemon? He is the guy in this swivel chair, not the one I'm sitting in, but in this picture here. He is experimenting with circular motion. And as he's doing that, he's thinking to himself, how am I going to apply this in my paper-free test? Because that's when it's going to come up. That's when it's going to be like, all right, apply my laws and you know the, the, the key principles, first principles of physics, my laws to some difficult questions. That's when I'm going to have to make sure I can do it. And the key, he realized as he was spinning round and round, is about actually RTF queuing. But he didn't wasn't satisfied with just knowing, yep, you've got to read the question, you've got to read the question. Okay, and he wasn't satisfied, well, okay, you've got to read it twice. He wanted to know, well, how am I going to read this question? What's my tactic? What's my trick? So we're going to go into the visualizer now, and I'm going to show you some kind of examples. I'm not going to go through the answers to these questions. I'm just going to go through the examples of RTF queuing with these questions. So this first one, right, okay, is actually a question that comes up time and time again, exactly the same time, time and time again. They give you an equation, 
Okay, and you have to basically figure out whether that is going to be a log um, graph, so if, if it's exponential, or if it's a log log graph, so if it's a power law. And this time you're told P is a constant, so it's a power law. Now, the big important thing about this is actually know the question style in your papers. Now, in Excel, they give exactly these type of thing. They give exactly this same question time and time again. And actually, they get pretty pretty simple straight away, right? So they explain why the log of uh, L versus log M gives a straight line, where it's because P is a constant because it's a power law. And then they give you a little table and you have to do some, some uh, manipulation of the data. So what I'm saying is make sure you review lots of your old papers, lots of old past papers for your paper free, as many as you can find, uh, because the types of questions will be very, very similar. And if you see this, uh, that's that style of question. I just know the procedure. I can almost guess the blooming, um the mark scheme, right? So the first one is for logging these and notice, look, all the significant figures, all three significant figures. So when you log these, you're not going to get the uh, marks unless you use the sig figs, right? Um, now you're going to plot the log graph, okay? You're going to think to yourself, oh, make sure I use up all the space. Make sure my data isn't just down here in one corner or only taking up half the x um, variable, the x direction, or half the y variable. So you're thinking, okay, this is exactly the same question. I just need to plot those things, but I need to make sure I use the whole thing. Make sure I've got my scales on here. This time I've got my labels on here because there's a mark for having labels with the units, just like there was at GCSE. Exactly the same thing. It's just the same question time and time again. So Dr. Lemon recognizes, oh, this is one of those questions. I know what the mark scheme is going to look like. You can write log of L in 10 to the 25 watts. Okay, and you can just put this in brackets. Even though the log is dimensionless, you can still use that unit and you can just use exactly the headings from the table. So it's pretty straightforward, really. And uh, down here, we've got log M. You're told what graph to plot in this time, but you could work that out as well. Then determine the values for P and L. Okay, well, in a power law, and because you've done plenty of practice with this power law, the gradient of the log log graph is the power. It's the exponent. It's the thing, it's the fixed number that it's raised to. Okay, and then you can you make sure you do that with a large triangle. You show the examiner you're calculating a gradient, you're gonna get a mark on this type of question by doing a large triangle, not using the data, not taking a couple of points, but by showing them that you're doing a large triangle, you get a mark even if your gradient's way wrong. Input the data for, then you so you, you work this, this number out and you input any data to work out the last. So you're given that equation, you go back to that, you've worked out P, which is the gradient, and now you input the data to work out the luminosity of the sun. So this is the same type of question again, and you're just thinking to yourself, no, Dr. Lemon's trick is gonna make sure that we are gonna get as many marks as possible, even if we're not sure what's going on. I've not once, in, that, in telling you how to do that question, told you anything about the majority of stars in the universe are thought to be main sequence stars. So I hope that makes sense so, so far. We're reading, not to be blinded by the context, we're reading to think, well, how am I gonna make sure I get the majority of these marks? So the next one, right, so, oh, wow, okay. So just take your time and apply what you already know about the practicals. And because you've sat and you've watched my live streams with all the core practicals and all the uh, PAGs for OCR and all the required practicals for AQA, you actually know how to do this and you know the accurate techniques for um, working with a Geiger Muller tube. Oh, look, determine how to do the corrected count rate. Hopefully you can all tell me how to do that now. You just need to know the accurate techniques for how to determine the, you know, in fact, you don't even need any of this information to do that because you've read it and you say, oh, look, just describe how to determine the corrected count rate. I've revised my PAGs straight away. Dr. Lemon's getting these marks. Next bit, okay. So again, oh, explain why this arrangement could lead to more accurate data. Haven't we been talking about this loads today? That there is using the Geiger Muller tube perpendicular to the gamma source. Okay, and it doesn't need to be, oh, that's coming in a second. So again, it's know your accurate techniques. I've talked you through these things. Go back through those videos, make sure you've got the accurate techniques, not just vary this, measure that. What do you measure it with and how do you make it accurate? What do you do to ensure that your techniques are accurate? So make sure you're going through those things, everybody. Okay, I'll explain another modification which can improve the accuracy. Well, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about larger values, haven't we? We've been talking about low percentage uncertainty. So actually, this is just... It's just, it doesn't even need to be about the practical. It's just really how do you be how do you get accurate um, data with things that are random? Okay, I've just talked about that. Repeating larger larger values, and look, that's been six marks just for knowing the accurate techniques for this PAG or this core practical or whatever. So make sure you know all of the accurate techniques, and that's just like boom, that's the one. 
Okay, we can guess which ones are going to come up, but you should really have a good idea of all the accurate techniques for all of the core practicals. Oh, look, here's look, C varies with inverse square law. So you've, you've read this, K is a constant. Aha, draw a line of best fit. Look, I didn't even, in fact, sorry, I didn't even need to remember that to, um, I didn't even need to read any of that to get that mark. I didn't need to read uh, the whole bit about the equation. This is just draw a line of best fit. Look, sharpen that pencil. My point is, Dr. Lemon's trick is that you read this twice. So the first thing, the first time you read it, you're thinking, oh, draw a line of best fit. And the second time you're thinking, well, how am I gonna solve that problem? I'm just gonna close the curtains there. getting uh, sunlight falling over my uh, visualizer there. So make sure you sharpen the pencil because Dr. Lemon knows that you need to be accurate to within half a small square and use a pencil, not a pen. Use, I suggest you buy clicky pencils, suggested this loads, because they're always sharp, okay? Moving on. So we haven't had to do anything with this yet, but notice that, that in this question, this is C to the power of minus a half or one over root C. Right, which you're told here. Um, and actually, this is the AQA method, which is not a core practical in Edexcel, but it is the core practical or the required practical in AQA. So by knowing the other examples, we know some variations on the practicals that they could ask us about. So be ready to do this. Oh, that's just straight up. That's the way AQA do the inverse square law. That's, that's where Kit explained to us how to be accurate. Okay, so discuss the extent at which the data obtained supports the student's conclusion. What's the conclusion? So look, the first thing I've read is discuss the extent. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm saying, well, what do I have to do? Now I'm reading back and thinking, aha, they say it obeys an inverse square law, which is that um, the count rate is proportional to one over D squared. Is it proportional? Is it directly proportional? We're looking back, yeah, it's linear, but it doesn't go through the origin, does it? which is <laughs> the thing that they talk about in detail in the accurate techniques in the AQA. Now, I don't know, I, I don't particularly think that the examiners look at the other exam boards for inspiration for these questions, but they, they are more just different ways of doing similar practicals, so they're well worth knowing about. So make sure you've gone through my three videos, which are the Edexcel ones, the AQA ones, and the OCR ones, okay? The free live feeds, all of the Edexcel, all of the OCR, all of the... Um, AQA and you if as long as you know the accurate techniques and this is another two marks for the accurate techniques right um, it suggested the investor justify this suggestion so I've got to just feel why is this correct right uh, radium emits this this is the information so what have I got to do what information do I have to do it um, 226 emits alpha beta and gamma hmm why could we do this it suggests the inversion of gamma radiation spreads out from a source using the apparatus shown could carry out with this. Well, how far is the alpha going to get? Alpha has a range, I think I was, I was talking about this earlier, wasn't I, of less than two centimeters. Beta is stopped by the, yeah, by casing of GM tube. Because I get these marks, well, Dr. Lemon gets these marks because he knows all of the accurate techniques for all of the core practicals, okay? And this is just, you know, when we were talking earlier on about this setup, we were talking about the only thing gonna get through this side is the gamma. If you are measuring alpha and beta, you have to have it this way on because the front window of a GM tube is very, very thin micro, uh, mica, sorry. And Alpha and beta can get through that very, very thin layer of mica. Okay, so that's that's all of that. Look, we, the way that we solve those problems, and I haven't told you all the answers for those, but I'm talking about solving the problems is by reading them really carefully twice, but with a tactic, not just thinking I'm gonna read them twice and hope that the second time it goes in. I'm RTFQing, but I'm RTFQing with a purpose is the important thing. I'm not gonna read this yet. I'm gonna read, oh look, criticize the student's table. So I didn't need to read any of that to get these marks, did I? Criticize the student's table. Well, you straight away see the sig figs. So that's one out of the two marks already. Now it's a bit more difficult, okay? For the second one, you maybe need to look look back. And the point they're trying to make is that you must record all of your raw data. So, you, so what they should have done was recorded the position on this meter rule here. 
and therefore um, worked out as a second um, so the position of the marker was one column and then calculated the extension as a second column. So for the second mark, you did need to look into that. But because we've read it in this way, we're thinking, huh, what am I reading it for? What am I actually rereading this stuff for? Not just, oh look, adding the masses and the new positions were recorded, the extension was calculated, but where is the position? So there should be a little column in here for position. So the second time of reading it, we weren't reading it for what we had to do, we were reading it for the information that we have to allow us to do that. Then the student used there, because it's the 21st century and it doesn't matter, um, data to plot a graph as shown. So determine a value, oh look, we could do this without reading any of that because we know that the equation for Hooke's law is f equals k delta x. So the gradient of this show the examiner that you're doing a large triangle. It's only going to be one of two things. It's only going to be a gradient. If they say use the graph to do something, it's only going to be a gradient or an area, isn't it? So use the graph, show the large triangle. And you don't need this for the two marks here, but convert this into meters earlier so that you don't have to convert it later. And then look, reading it, calculate the frequency at which the system oscillates. What's the info is the second time. So the first reading, what do we have to actually do? The second reading, what information do we have to allow us to do that? So this is the information we've got here. We've got mass, just convert that into kilograms because why not? And then this is in Newtons per meter look. So again, that's what we talked about converting early so we didn't have to convert later. And this is the equation. This information is also from our equation sheet. Don't forget to go and do that again. All right, let's do it. Um, so the next one, okay, so explain why magnet B starts to oscillate with increasing amplitude. I start reading here, this is my first reading, what do I have to do? And actually, I realize I can get most of these marks without talking about this at all, because oscillate with increasing amplitude is a resonance. This is the idea, it's a big idea in physics. So I'm gonna bang down my one, two, three explanation of resonance. Um, driving frequency equals natural frequency, therefore maximum energy transfer, therefore rapidly increasing amplitude, and I've got three marks. Now what, where is these frequencies and these forces coming from to drive it? Well, that's about um, EMF induction um, and causing a force, so the motor effect. So the next marks are just applying the context there. But my key point is, you could actually get most of these marks without even reading the context. So loads of people complain, haha, this is really, really uh, wiggy there. I know all the, the, the information, I know all the content, but then they ask me strange questions and I can't do it because I don't even get what they're asking me about. But if you start, if you read in Dr. Lemon's way, if you start by reading what you're asked to do and then you read again for how you're gonna do that or the information you've got to do it, you're much more likely to get those marks that you don't need even to know what the context is to get them. Okay, so moving back, look, calculate the velocity of Bernard's star. That's what we're asked to do. What information do we have to do it? Well, there's a difference in wavelength. And actually, this is about redshift. So um, redshift Z is equal to the change in wavelength over the wavelength, which is roughly equal to V over C. So we can use the information we've got and the information on our equation sheet to give us our um, information to solve the problem. What's the problem? What's the information we've got to solve it? It's the way to read. Next one, look, describe how diffraction gratings is used and the measurements that should be should be taken. You don't even need to, look, to do this. This is just exactly the core practical we've been talking through, which is the diffraction grating, measure a wavelength, n lambda equals d sine theta, basically, what do you need to measure? How do you measure them? How the diffraction grain is used? There's like I said, three mark, describe my written bits and bobs from that uh, video earlier. We'll just get you that those three marks without needing to think about um, this is about stars and we wanna know the wavelength of light from distant stars. It's nothing to do with that. It's just describe that practical, right? Um, then here's using the um, using the data to use that equation, use appropriate calculations. So it's, it's about the same idea, it's about that practical that you've recognized. 
what do you have to do? You have to comment on the suitability of using this. So you know at the end you need to make a comparison here to get these final marks here, the, five, the fourth mark. So you've got a difference in wavelength and just remember here that your first thing, this is what you have to do, that's number one. The info is this stuff plus the stuff in the stem. So you might have to use the stuff from earlier on in the question. No, that's not the stem, sorry. Earlier on in the question and here's the wavelengths that you're supposed to use in that question as well. So don't forget the info information could be in the stem as well as in the part of the question that you're doing. And don't forget, whenever you're asked to comment, deduce, etc., use the crocodiles. If something's much, much smaller than something, it's a bit smaller than something, it's roughly equal to it, or it is equal to it, to that many significant figures, it's bigger than it, or it's much, much bigger than it. Make your comparative statement um, to, to do that. Okay, again, what are you asked to do? Calculate the mean kinetic energy of an atom. What information do you have? Just the temperature and the equations given to you. Okay, that's not the full equation, but that's the idea. That's the core, that's the key idea. The temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy. Describe how atoms emit visible light. You don't need context. It doesn't matter these uh, atoms. How do atoms emit visible light? Well, now you're just applying your ideas about quantum and how atoms actually give out light. Fluoresce is about those discrete energy level changes. Remember, the electrons come down and they emit a uh, photon. It's pretty much two marks there. There are only discrete energy levels and might be about it being visible light. A little bit of context maybe uh, because you might have to talk about the, the, that energy level being within the range of visible light, the energies of photons in visible light. Last one then, okay, what's meant by isotopes? You don't need any of this information to do that. In fact, GCSE kids could do that, couldn't they? What's meant by isotopes? It's got the same number of protons as the rest of the elements, but it's got a different number of neutrons or a different mass number. Okay, um, in a mass spectrometer, oh look, show the speed. Let's talk about the speed. Right, so what information do we have? Uh, we've got um, accelerated through these, so it's given EV, it's given um, energy, it's given, uh, I, I just remember this, EV equals half mv squared, and hence we can get back to the uh, kinetic energy. So the, when we accelerate a charged particle, we give it kinetic energy by accelerating it through a field, and that's equal to its charge times whatever voltage we have accelerated it through. And you've been given a mass. What do you have to do? What information do you have to do it? Next bit, okay, add to the diagram to indicate the direction of the electric field. It, there's no need to understand the, the context. You know that field lines go from positive to negative, so the direction is this way. You know this. It's the direction of a field line of a, um, do that with a ruler incidentally and have them touch the things that you're going to and have them equally spaced, at least four of them. Um, the, <laughs> what was the talking about? The field lines go in the direction of a positively charged particle, the force on a positively charged particle. Right, so um, deduce whether the magnetic flux density, ah, oh, deduce means I've got to use my crocodiles. I've got to make a, a comparative statement at the end. What do I actually need to calculate though? Whether this magnetic flux density is suitable to produce a beam of speed of this. So now I need to go back and use my magnetic flux density um, and my equation F equals BQV. How do I know that? Because it's got a V in it. It's got, I've got a charge from previous question. I've got, give, been given that, I can work out a force here. Okay, so I'm not worrying too much about solving the problems, but where, you know, what is the problem? Is your first task to think about? What problem do I need to actually solve? What information do I have to solve it? And then after passing through, um, oh, do you know what? I don't even need to read that yet. I'm going to start here. Explain why the ions or anything travels in a circular path. No context needed for this question. I guarantee you this question is just about having a force at right angles to its motion. So you have a centripetal force. So you don't need the context. You could read it and you could talk about this ion and the force being a, a you know, F equals BQV force, motor effect force at right angles to the thing that's moving. But you don't need the context for those two marks. So what do you need to do, what information do you have to do it? Then calculate the radius of the circle. So calculate is what you need to do, what information do I have? Okay, I've got this equation um, and I've got details. Throughout that I've got my, my magnetic field strength. I know what the charge is on these ions. I've been told they've just got um, the singly ionized, so they've got a charge of one uh, E or one Q. Um, I've got a speed from a previous one and I've got a mass that I can get from my equation sheet. So there's, what do you need to do? 
what information you have to do it. And lastly, add another good diagram to show these chlorine 37 ones. Well, they're more massive, aren't they, than the chlorine 35 ones. So what's, what's the curvature going to be? So add another line for this more massive thing. Well, more massive thing, given the same force, is going to have less curvature, isn't it? So this is the way to do this. And then the last thing, explain any differences, just as well, what's different about these two particles? Same charge, more mass. Does that help? Is that trick worth having tuned in for? You tell me. How was that? Was Dr. Lemon's trick useful for you? I'll do Q&A now, how about that? I'll have a little look through, and then I'm gonna talk about uncertainties quite briefly. And then I'm going to say good evening to you all. It's been an absolute pleasure to hang out with you all today. Um, yeah, so poor old Yam, that's a difficult one. You've got to do overnight isolation. I have no idea how they'd even do that. <laughs> um, yeah, it does work for GCC, definitely. Uh, you should definitely do A-level physics, everyone, uh, because it's the most exciting A-level, um, most interesting A-level. Yeah, I've been in, I've been enjoying it though. It's been hard work, to be honest. I've, I started planning these a couple of days ago, and it's been hard work. But it, I'm glad you've been. Used. Who is Dr. Lemon? People are asking again. This person in the chair. Uh, I'm not Dr. Lemon. I'm Kit. <laughs> yeah, inverse square law, SHM, and one practical you've never seen. What exam board is that for, Human Snake? What are you thinking for that one? Uh, I don't know. I'll just tune in and say huge thanks. That's a person called Lemons for everything you're doing for us. Once again, thank you. It's my pleasure enjoying it. For, so for GCC, Dr. Lem would say, what I'm being asked, put down equation relevant, yeah, read a second time and get the data. Is that right? That's definitely a good way to tackle it. That sounds good to me. Basically, you always think to yourself, what am I being asked to do? What information do I have to do it? Including equations, including data. Um, glad that was helpful, Jai. Makes the context question seem a little bit less scary. Good, I'm glad. And they're synoptic as well, aren't they? Because they have one context with loads of different areas. But instead of thinking about, well, what's the context? We're just thinking about what's the areas that we can apply to it. Okay. Yeah, okay, it's unfortunate. But then but the, your your, your uh, option will still have questions you can use to solve that. Human next guess was for AQA, that's cool. What to do if you've done all the question sections for AQA? I would look at some other ones from a different exam boards because as you can just see that, that one was really related to the AQA uh, thing. You could get a zero in one paper and potentially get an X though. I wouldn't imagine, I wouldn't recommend trying it. All right, so I'm gonna do a little bit on uncertainties now. So we'll go back into the visualizer. If you've got any questions, then ask. If not, that's gonna be me for the day. All right, so uncertainties. Um, I'm going to think about just trying to calculate something quite simple, like calculate a speed. Okay. Um, now we, we need to obviously measure distance and time and different instruments we use have different uncertainties based on, or what we'd expect their uncertainties to be based on their scales, right? So we could measure the, um, with a ruler distance with a ruler. Now that's going to be appropriate for anything kind of greater than 10 centimeters. Why is it appropriate for something greater than 10 centimeters? Because, well, the scale division is one millimeter. So you could say the uncertainty is one millimeter, right? Now there's been a lot of debate of whether it's 0 0.5 millimeters, half scale division, or one millimeter. And it might be because we're lining up one side with, um, you know, the start and one side with the end. Uh, so it's, it's uh, plus or minus half either side, or it might be because it's plus or minus half a millimeter, so the total uncertainty is one millimeter. Or it might just be that you want to just see half a scale division as being uncertainty, and that's fine. Now, actually, exam boards will accept all of them. It's more about showing an exam board that you know how to work out a percentage uncertainty and you understand the significance of that than it is got anything to do with the absolute uncertainty. But anyway, it's about one millimeter, so I'm going to use one millimeter. Now, if I measure 10 centimeters, with one millimeter, then my percentage uncertainty, which is the actual uncertainty, the absolute uncertainty, over the measurement is what you call the percentage uncertainty. I'll times it by 100 to get a percent if you like, but anyway, I'm sure you can handle fractions and percentages. So one millimeter over 100 millimeters, which is 10 centimeters, gives me a percentage uncertainty of 1%, okay? That's not bad, probably, you know, if I'm getting below 5% in a lab, I'm pretty happy really most of the time. Now I could use a vernier scale. 
Okay, now that would be appropriate for things that are less than 10 centimeters, but above sort of one, uh, sorry, less than 10 centimeters, but above sort of one centimeter, okay? That might be an appropriate device to use. Now the uncertainty in measurement with a vernier scale is 0.1 millimeter, okay? The scale division of a vernier scale is 0.1 millimeter. So the percentage uncertainty in something that is about 10 centimeters is 0.1 over 100, which is 0.1%, okay? So that's much better if, I can, if I've got something 10 centimeters and I've got a vernier scale that goes up 10 centimeters, then that would be good. That would be 10% less um, uncertainty, brilliant. But I can't use it for things that are really, really big. So I can't measure 10 meters with this vernier scale, okay? Not a vernier calipers at least. Vernier scales can be attached to things that are meant for measuring larger distances than that, but uh, leave that for another day. Now, if it was smaller than that, if it was like smaller than um, 2.5 centimeters, then I might use a micrometer screw gauge. Now, micrometers have an uncertainty of 0 0.01 millimeters. Okay, they, they go down to 0 0.01 millimeters. Now, if I'm gonna do um, 0 0.01 over 25 millimeters, then that gives me a percentage uncertainty of 0.04%. So even smaller, brilliant. But I can only measure things up to about, sort of, I think the gap is like five centimeters or something, right? So you need to make an informed choice over what instrument you're using. You can't just say, measure the distance across a sports hall with a micrometer, because it won't fit. So it does need to be about the size of the thing and the scale, not just think that always the smallest scale is, is the best, right? Okay, so that's my measurement of distance. And basically I'm going to measure something that's 10 centimeters long and I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to use a ruler, right? So my distance is 10 centimeters plus or minus 0 0.1 centimeter. Um, that's my distance, right? And the percentage uncertainty of that was 1%. Now I'm going to need to time something, aren't I? So I'm going to need to use a stopwatch. Now stopwatches, they measure down to hundredth of a second normally, right? But that is definitely not the uncertainty of using a stopwatch. I think I'll do this on the next page, why not? Because if you try and time something to a hundredth of a second with a stopwatch, you're definitely not going to get it. Now there's two ways that you can work out the uncertainty. You can either say, to yourself, well, um, I know that reaction time is about 0.2 seconds, and that's what I'm gonna use. Or you can actually measure things several times and you can use half the range as being your uncertainty. But if we're predicting, we don't have our results yet, so I'm gonna say the expected uncertainty in timing is 0.2 seconds, okay? Now, um, I just want to make, that, make this clear. So stopwatches are good for things larger than a second. If we were to do the uncertainty of a second, you could see that would be like 20%. So that's no good for anyone, is it? It's gotta be bigger than that to get uncertainty. You can repeat and that can reduce your uncertainty um, because you can get a, a, a spot the anomalies and calculate a mean. That can be really, really good. But let's just talk about one result. And so I'm gonna use it for measuring something that's 10 centimeters. So my time is 10, sorry, seconds. So my uncertainty is 0.2 and the time is 10. And so the percentage uncertainty of this reading is 2%. And that's okay, that's sort of, you know, within acceptable lab conditions. Um, where do we get up to? So now I'm gonna go ahead and work out my speed. I'm going to do distance, which I measured with my ruler, which had a percentage uncertainty of 1% and was 10 plus or minus 0 0.1 centimeters. 10 centimeters. My time was 10 seconds. So my actual um, speed is 1.0 meters per second, centimeters per second. I apologize because I've randomly done this in centimeters. But well, what's the uncertainty of that? I can't just add 0 0.2 and 0 0.1 because that's kind of meaningless, right? Well, that, that, those are two different dimensions. So to actually work out the percentage uncertainty in speed, I need to add the percentage uncertainties of the things that I have, um, that I have measured. 
So my percentage uncertainty for speed is equal to my percentage uncertainty for distance plus my percentage uncertainty for time. So my total percentage uncertainty for my speed is uh, two, sorry, 1% for my distance plus 2% for my timing. So my total uncertainty is 3%. So now I can express my speed as 1.0 plus or minus 0.03 centimeters per second. Okay, because 0.03 is 3% of one. Now those are very simple numbers. Okay, so that's easier to understand the kind of process. And it's only an equation with just one or two variables to calculate um, a third. But if you've got an equation with five variables, then you just need to work out all the individual percentage uncertainties and you always just add them together. It doesn't matter if you divide to get a result or you multiply or anything like that to get a result. The percentage uncertainty of the, of the result is just the sum of all the individual percentage uncertainties. And then you work backwards to work out the absolute uncertainty, in this case, plus or minus 0 0.03 from the percentage uncertainty. That's uncertainties. It's not as hard as people make it out, I think. And yeah, I absolutely agree that there's that blooming horrible kind of, um, there's that horrible, <laughs> you know, argument over whether it's plus or minus 0 0.5 or a total uncertainty of one, or is it half scale division or full scale division? The exam boards will credit you either way. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a bit more chat and then I'm going to go. Um, how do you know which uncertainty calculation to use, like the mean uncertainty? Well, it's it's whether you're predicting or whether you are, uh, whether you've got results. So if you've got repeated results, you can use half the range. If you're predicting, you should use the um, the scale division or a sensible guess. So the sensible guess that I was talking about was, you know, with a stopwatch, we're never going to be half a scale division. So it's better in that case to use the. Um, it's better in that case to use what you know to be a sensible kind of thing. So this is my summing up thing. <laughs> uh, right, okay, so what do you think of Comfort for Excel? So I did my live feed a, a few days ago just preparing for paper three where we talked about some expected ones. I've gone through three um, already. I'm going to do one more. I think likely might be um, EMF and internal resistance, falling ball viscometer, which I'm going to do the night before, and for Mr. and potential divider, and this gamma rays one that we've been talking about today. Which scenario would you double your uncertainty? Um, I'm not sure what exactly you mean by that, Alina. I'm sorry. Um, do you maybe like if, if you were squaring it, if you if you were doing something um, times d squared, then you work out your uncertainty of d, and then you double it. In for the final uncertainty, um, oscilloscope speed of sound core practical. I think. Well, I've got a great video on that for a start, Sajir. If you if you go and find my uh, core practicals playlist, that's in that one. Or if you just Google um, Gorilla Physics speed of sound, you should find the oscilloscope practical speed of sound. Yeah, Jai, that's a value squared definitely. Um, thanks, yeah, I'm glad to help. Yeah, look over the required practical handbook for physics AQA level and check if your skills are up to scrap. Exactly. That's all I've really done to prepare for this. I've just kind of summarized it for you guys because I'm nice like that. But um, really, all this information is just from what the exam boards have provided for you, uh, which is digested into textbooks or into videos like this or into um, just the actual stuff from the horse's mouth. And I would go back to that stuff from the horse's mouth. Just go for it. Make sure you know all the accurate techniques. You saw that there was there was it ended up being eight questions, eight marks for just the accurate techniques for that gamma ray practicals. Rebecca, thanks. I feel like I've spent all day with you because of all the live streams. Yeah, glad. Nice to spend time with you, Rebecca. Yeah. I hope it all helps, you know, let me know. Don't don't forget, share this out so other people can spend more time with me. <laughs> and also, um, like, let me know how it went in your real thing. Okay, I know you're gonna do really, really well if you spent like this afternoon just sitting watching me chat about experiments. Okay, yeah, it's been good. I've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Um, I'm gonna go and relax. Glad, thank you so much, thank you. Yeah, 
look, I'm, I'm really happy to help. That's what I'm all about, really. It's just, it's nice to have people want to listen to you. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> that's been Dr. Lemon's trick. Okay, um, so you can say thank you to Dr. Lemon in the comments, please, everybody. And don't forget to like this uh, this feed. And don't forget to share it out with your friends. All right, cheers.